introduced me to so many people, and we hear like, oh, Erie, what are we going to do about Erie? Oh. You know, and, and I, I shouldn't pick on Erie. Like, it could be, you know, Spokane, oh, Gary, Indiana, oh, Buffalo, oh. There's a lot of angst, rightfully so. But if you want to talk real angst, look at what's happening in Puerto Rico right now. They don't even have statehood. Their muni bonds are on the verge of default. Everybody's fleeing the island. Yet they're turning to entrepreneurship as a potential plank to recover from what's happening there. That's uh, me saying something I'm told, kind of intelligent, in Spanish. Um, I do not speak Spanish. I am not a polyglot. Aber wenn Sie möchten, ich könnte mit dir jetzt in Deutsch reden. Aber ich kann keine Deutsche hier sehen. So vielleicht müssen wir, we'll just stick to English. But uh, I'm told that is very smart. And then, say again? Good. I have validation, third party confirmation. That's good. And then finally, and I hope, I haven't had a chance to ask Beth yet, she's got a, uh, I've got a photo up here with me having disrupt in the back. And I hope that wasn't the criteria for getting the gig. Beth, you're going to have to confirm that for me. But uh, that was me actually at another disrupt conference. You know, this notion of entrepreneurship being disruptive is a fairly common one. People are really beginning to realize the catalyst for economic activity that it can have. And that was in another really vibrant economic place known as Athens, Greece. And I was there last year. And I, I mentioned these other examples only to give some perspective. You know, I, through the, the visits I had three weeks ago when I was here, and again today, we had a whirlwind tour. You know, there's a lot of anxiety, good and bad. But it's all relative. So typically when I have a chance to address a group like yours, what I like to do is I like to level set the conversation and start with kind of a global perspective. Because first and foremost, we need to recognize, especially as all the entrepreneurs here in the, in the house know, we do not exist in a vacuum. The market is not eerie. The competition is not Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Buffalo. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a, well, I had a cell phone. If you have a cell phone in your pocket, the world is your market. The competition is coming from Ningbo, China, and Bogota, and other places, right? So let's look at a global scale. This is the World Economic Forum. I got to uh, serve at the World Economic Forum, two-year stint on the Global Agenda Council for Fostering Entrepreneurship. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the work of the WEF, the WEF does the work of setting the agenda for Davos, the biggest priorities for the world, where the world leaders come and say, this is what we're thinking about. And when you've served on a uh, WEF Council, you get to participate in the annual agenda. And look at what we're seeing for 2015 According to the World Economic Forum, the largest issues facing our planet today. Number one, deepening in income inequality. Persistent jobless growth, number two, lack of leadership. Sound familiar? We're not immune to that here in Erie, are we? You know, this is meant, as I said, to give you global perspective that what happens in Erie happens in elsewhere. That's to give you some notion that you're not alone or unique in the, tr the, you know, the struggles that are happening here. The other thing that I like to do with this list and share it is, and especially when you're thinking about things like increasing water stress, um, you know, the weakening of representative democracy, pollution, the people that will solve these problems will be entrepreneurs. Because the entrepreneurs of the world birth the new. They are not the ones that are invested in the status quo. Their job is to find the connection to society and humanity to serve it with something of value and bring that creativity to reality. The reason this is important is inescapable. Unfortunately, we all stood as witnesses this weekend the atrocities that happened in Paris. Yet another example of global instability. For those of you who are uh, fans and readers of Sir Paul Collier, Nobel laureate, 
he came up with a very simple algorithm, if you will, theory, that basically says the risk of economic, uh, a risk of conflict is directly proportionate to the amount of economic opportunity that exists. The higher the income levels, the higher the participation level in the economy, the lower the risk. The lower the participation, which means the more disenfranchised the population becomes, the higher the risk. For me, one of the things that was very profound to read, and he says this very plainly in his works, which is why he's been recognized for it, is that there is evidence that the causes of conflict point to economic factors as the drivers of conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not about establishing a caliphate. It's not about all this religious ideology. That's the cover story for the conflict. The real reason is it's lack of economic participation. If I don't have anything vested in my community, in my society, then all of a sudden I become susceptible to the perversions of any faith. Of any faith. I used to say tongue-in-cheek, and a few uh, heads turned when I was at the World Economic Forum in Dubai saying this. I said, you want world peace? Spread the gospel of entrepreneurship. Because if you have something vested in your community, something that you get up, run into your clients half-naked to serve, if you're that passionately committed, then you got something to fight for. You have something to be decent for. That's the way we're going to do it. That's the challenge you have here in Erie, just on a smaller scale, thank God. The other thing that I like to point out, and I'm not smart enough to be uh, very, very profound, so I have to sometimes be provocative. Um, Gallup has been doing for over two decades now what they call the uh, Global Engagement Survey, where they have surveyed nearly a million, they survey nearly a million people, uh, over 900,000. Oh, I'm probably driving the camera guy crazy. Sorry about that, dude. Um, they survey almost a million people on engagement in the workforce. Okay, so I'm going to do this a little differently than I usually do. Let me show of hands how many people manage employees here. A good number of you. Either as business owners or even in a company where, you know, you're not the owner but you have staff, right? So let me whip this out on you. Excuse me while I whip this out. Twenty-four percent of workers are actively disengaged in their work. And by Gallup's definition, this means they show up every day and do something against the interest of their employer. Okay? The 63 percent that are disengaged, those are you know, the, the passively disengaged. They're not hurting the company, but they're not going anywhere out of their way to do anything special for the company. Leaving a paltry 13% that are actively engaged in their work. Now, we can be, you know, outraged for a whole host of reasons, right? Um, economically, especially. Think about lost GDP, right? Lost productivity. You know, you have, you have a workforce of 100 people, and only 13 are in the boat paddling in the same direction, right? And you got 24 going in the opposite direction, and 63 are like, la di la 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 whatevs. But beyond lost productivity and what that could mean from other things like cascading job growth, right, strengthening economy, to me, the sadder story in this is what the, you know, the quiet lives of desperation that are being lived by people who are actively disengaged in their work. I mean, I, I like to believe I don't know many of these people because I think they're, they would be sad, and I would be depressed knowing these people. This is not how we serve and expand humanity, ladies and gentlemen. We have to find a reason to get them engaged. Now, you're not immune. Do you like my upbeat notion? I got everybody really depressed. Alcohol is going to go through the roof sales right now. You're not immune. I don't have to tell you this. You know this, right? And let me be clear. 
they are not, GE is not a villain. This isn't the slide to get, you know, the sympathetic boos from the audience. Their job, what a big company exists to do, is not to create jobs. That's a byproduct of what they do. It's not what they're supposed to do. What they are supposed to do for shareholder value, you know, the mantra of the boilerplate, and I know I'm being kind of a cold jerk about saying this, but their job is to increase productivity. They are rewarded to do more with less. And in case you haven't noticed, the 21st century work skills and workforce is changing. You know, for those of you who've read Jim Clifton's, you know, The Coming Job Wars, that's something outrageous, like 40% of us will all be 1099 employees, like, within a decade. Yeah, think about that. We've got to make you valuable, right? That's, that's just a byproduct. That's the new normal. You know, I know in places like Erie, there's also this temptation to say, well, it's cyclical. They've done this before. It comes and goes, right? That's what we tell ourselves. This is bad news. I saw the story about the woman that just opened a coffee shop, right? And she strategically selected, I don't know if she's even in the house, but selected strategically for proximity reasons to the plant. I get that. But this is not, you know, cyclical. This is the new normal. In fact, if you're curious to understand what creates and generates jobs, you know, in the world today, or at least in the U.S. for sure, it's nascent firms, companies less than five years old. Companies less than five years old are creating all net new job growth in the country today. And when you think about it, it makes sense. You're a new company. You don't have manufacturing yet. You don't have assembly lines. All you can do is hire people to produce your goods or services. That's why. At some point, you're going to go through this search mode where you come into growth mode, and then you're going to start worrying about replication, efficiency, scalability, specializations, things like that. And at some point, you typically kind of peak, and then you do a slight adjustment, correction, and then you keep at some happy equilibrium for the foreseeable future if you're lucky. But it's the new companies that will replace these 1,500 jobs. The other thing that, you know, I get to be the jerk from the outside because I don't live in your community. That's what I get paid the outrageous fee of next to nothing to come here and talk to you tonight to say. You know, if you don't figure out a way to have more people starting the companies that replace these, then you'll have a different story told. That'll be a different chapter for the economic future. The thing that concerns me on a grander scale is the trend that's happening. So right up until the big old crash, new net job, or excuse me, new firm creation in the country was humming along at a very nice level. It was consistently around 600,000 plus or minus 50,000. And it's important to track that, as Brookings does, as my alma mater, uh, the Kauffman Foundation does, because that's kind of like the canary in the coal mine, right? And then there's obviously a failure rate. So X number of firms exit every year as X number of firms enter every year. Well, we hit a very bad intersection at the crash. You know, liquidity, we can point fingers as to why. Liquidity drew up, you know, uh, dried up overnight. I had many friends and, and companies that I was mentoring that were harmed by this. But they go out of business, and the new firm entry slowed. This is a trend that, you know, again, Erie's not immune to. And it's one that we should all be concerned about, especially as it relates to policy-related work that we do. There's a theory I've heard that we're going into an election season. I don't know. Something gave it away. And what I like to do when I have an opportunity like this is to remind you all that you have a responsibility as the electorate to really demand of the people that we're putting in the positions to pull the levers that they understand what the true drivers of the economy are and what's happening, that they understand this data. Because this is, as I said, the canary in the coal mine that predicts what it'll be in the future. So do I have everybody nice and depressed? Good. 
because this is where I like to do that clever speaker trick and like turn it around now and we're going to get all cheerful and unicorns are going to come prancing on the floor. Um, I actually love this little New Yorker cartoon. I'll be happy to give you an innovative thinking. What are the guidelines? All right. This is a challenge that we've seen in economic development work all around the country. You know, there's a, an old tried and true methodology. You know, we pull the standard levers. We look at smokestack chasing. You know, we're going to give tax abatements to draw in, again, those big companies that, like, do 1,500 job cuts at a time. And this is, like, kind of the rote process that we go through. It's time for a new model, a new paradigm for doing that, if I can use that bad cliché. And for hints on what to do, I go to the big thinking groups that worry about stuff like this. So this is, you know, the, the top um, areas that the World Bank looks at. They, they publish a report every year called the Doing Business Report, where they rank every country in the world on how good it is for doing business. And by the way, not to have any bust any illusions in the audience, the U.S. is not number one. In case anybody here is laboring under that, I know if Trump wins, we'll be huge, we'll huge, and we'll get tired of winning, but we're not quite there yet. There's a few countries that get up ahead of us. These are the things that they mark. You know, starting the business, construction, protecting minority investors, paying taxes, trade. This is all mundane stuff, but this is the blocking and tackling stuff that every entrepreneur in this room will tell you is the stuff that occupies their day. How to figure out getting permits, you know, how to export my, my product and service, how do I get paid. This is the stuff that if we figure out, I know it's not sexy, but the unsexy is where the real work gets done. To give you an example of what this means from a global stage, I'm sure most of you uh, in the audience remember Rwanda and the genocide that happened in the 90s, mass genocide. You know, over a million people in a nine-month period of time murdered. They were for the year of that, which I believe was 1993. Don't quote me on that. But they were dead last on the World Bank's Doing Business Report for the obvious reason. There was no rule of law. Nobody would go there, right? You would not in a million years start a business there. But they started from a policy standpoint over years of recovery to focus on a pro-entrepreneurial growth agenda. They wanted to make the country attractive for foreign direct investment. They did big education reform initiatives to put entrepreneurship education into the public education system and secondary education system. They put policymakers in place that understood all this. And over several years, in a decade's time, they're now in the 40s. They outrank many Latin American countries, several of the Eastern you know, Europe countries. They're like respectable. This is a country that survived mass genocide. That's the power of entrepreneurship. The next is the Legatum Prosperity Index. Legatum tracks what makes countries wealthy. And by the way, this applies on regional level. So this isn't like I'm not comparing. You could look at this and say in the broadest categories, this could be the eerie strategy. Look at what's number one on their prosperity index, entrepreneurship and opportunity. Entrepreneurship is the great equalizer. It's what allows, you know, David to compete with Goliath and do a whole bunch more, driving innovation, creating jobs, the tax base that we need to survive. Oops, yes, it's rewind. Brookings has been doing a multi-year project, the, state, um, the project on state metropolitan innovation. You know, as I said, this environment is changing. Some of the old tried methods of economic development are actually giving way to some new thinking. Their model shows basically there's a platform. Think of it as the footers of your house. You know, they use the word enablers of infrastructure and governance. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the basic blocking and tackling that you have to, do, you have to just do it right. So this is city hall, county governan governance, you know, working together figuring out the things that they need to figure out, that's taken as a given. And if that's a given, you start building upon that through innovation and talent. You know, you have universities in the region. We've got to get them to start playing together nicely. 
and collaborating as a block. You're stronger together. There's a talent gap. How many people here own a business and would hire somebody today if they were qualified for the job? I hear that everywhere. There isn't a problem of not enough jobs. The problem is we don't have enough qualified people to put in those jobs. That's the big gap. The big aha moment for me has been this, you know, next uh, top on the uh, block on the top, trade. This has come out in like the last couple years where, of course, your big cities had port authorities, you know, established and they're doing trade and they're having like sister city programs in other countries. But this is now communities, you know, as big as Erie looking at trying to attract foreign direct investment. Because you have a great, you know, a great thing to sell here, a great lifestyle, good committed people, hard workers. You know, you have something to sell. Your biggest problem is selling this, this notion to yourself. And I was, go for it. I was interviewed for the, you know, the paper and I put that, they made it in the print. You, you have to fake it until you make it. Because if you don't start believing in yourself, you can't convey that it's worthy for others to come and invest in your community as well. You know, it's funny, I live in Mentor, Ohio, so I'm only like 80 some miles away. You know, we come out to Presque Isle all the time. People here hear that and they're like, why? Because it's awesome? I don't know why that is. It's a phenomenon. And like I said, I can go to any other city and hear the same thing and just know that it's just hard to believe in yourselves. I don't know. I don't have an answer for that, by the way, other than to be that rude jerk from outside the region and say, get over yourself. Believe in it. Because if you all put your shoulders behind the boulder together, you're going to start moving that boulder a lot faster. If you figure that out, that's the magic. That's where opportunity and prosperity starts. It starts, and I got to tell you, where I've seen it happen in places like Kansas City, it starts becoming this self-perpetuating virtuous cycle. You find one little thing to build on, and then you start adding onto it like a Christmas tree. And then it starts with momentum. And then you have a couple people in the know that are, as I said, faking it until they make it. And then all of a sudden, people from outside the region go, Hey, have you heard about the Erie effect? Trademark pending. Right? Screw Silicon Valley. What's going on in Erie? I want to know. That's how that happens. That's how that momentum happens. And you have diversified clusters. The other thing that's happening, and this again inspired by my work at the World Economic Forum, is that there's, you know, I think there's a convergence happening. So there's many of us that are practitioners in the economic development space, so that's policy, chamber work, everything that we're talking about tonight. And then there's a whole other body of work that's in education reform. I'm about to start paying three college tuitions. Lucky me. And so my, like, my professional and personal lives are converging. You know, and anybody that's in higher ed doesn't have to be told that we are in an unsustainable business model. You know, student debt now at a trillion plus with onerous restrictions on it, too. You can't, like, uh, bankrupt your way out of that kind of stuff, right? Your colleges, you know, your reimbursements are now performance-based, whatever that draconian little moniker means, right? It's really setting up. I, I had a client in, in uh, Florida, his words, not mine. The new performance-based reimbursement at the state level is setting up a wonderful... Darwinian cage match for all of us. In Florida, what they said was, this was brilliant too, I wish I was in the room and this was decided. The state legislature said, we've got a, a pot of money that's X, and we're going to rank all the community colleges in the state. You're going to be in one of three buckets, top third, middle third, bottom third. If you're in the top third, good news, your budgets are going to be increased. If you're in the middle third, eh, you're not getting any more money, but you're not going to lose any money. And guess what happens if you're in the bottom third? So let's think about that. We'll take the most struggling school system and defund them more because that's the way to improve, right? I'm being sarcastic, of course, but what I'm saying is there's a convergence happening. Economic development 
and education reform are coming together to become one and the same. You want to reform and make the economy stronger, fix the education system. That's what's broken. We have clients, I have about 140 clients, uh, mostly community colleges all over the country. I was stunned, absolutely stunned to learn by talking to the presidents of the school, what percent of their students come in and test at what's called remedial or developmental, meaning they're not at grade ready. The best answer, as I spit all over the stage, the best answer I got was 50% testing at remedial developmental, and the worst answer was 90%. Think about that. And what do you do with that from a humanity standpoint? And how do I turn that into something that's going to positively give back to the economy? That's the challenge we have, and that's why the World Economic Forum has said we have to put entrepreneurship into the essence of what education is. It's not a business acumen, it's a life skill. The bottom billion I mentioned, uh, Paul Collier before, he had the, uh, the equation that I showed you. You know, he gives us some hope. By the way, there's a couple books I, I'm pimping here. I highly recommend them, they're a great read. Um, we publish on our Eli website many other books if you're an insomniac like me and you just need to read. But he's really relying on the fact of um, at some point, you know, what's going to happen is this kind of enlightened compassion and enlightened self-interest. And what he really means by that is even those that are in power in the positions of control will eventually say it's in our collective interest to fix this system because I can only helicopter from my gated community into my shopping center so much before the stench of the body still come through the gates, right? Finally, uh, Thomas Piketty, he got a lot of heat for this book when it came out because he was attacking, you know, uh, capital structures, you know, stranded wealth and things like that. And, you know, I don't really have a position on that. You can read that yourself. But one of the things that he did put out there that got buried because of the other controversy was that really, you know, the main force in favor of greater equality has been the diffusion of knowledge and skills. And you have that here. You have so much talent. You have so much ability here. You have so much goodwill. We just have to figure out a way to diffuse it into the community. So I'd like to close with just a very short video to give you some hope and understanding that in places that have far less the diffusion of knowledge and skills can overcome great adversity. And if you can do it in a place like Mal Malaya, Africa, you can do it in Erie, Pennsylvania. My name is William Kangpamba, and I'm from Malawi. And the economy of Malawi, most of them we depend on farming. Yeah, we depend on tobacco. I'm 20 years old now. My village, I've got uh, 60 families, here, and my family, we are about 20. I was dropped out because I didn't, my parents have no money to pay me a school fees, and uh, a school fees is uh, $80. We have enough wind in Malawi, and I, uh, I was thinking, well, what can I do to use that wind so that we can have something? That's why I decided to read some books about the windmills. The first time I saw a windmill in the book, they just come up with the build the, come up with the pictures, but they didn't say anything what you can do to build that windmill so that you can generate electricity or you can pump water. You figured that out on your own? Yeah, I figured out on my own. If this windmill is in this book, if, uh, if I can try, maybe I can make money so that I can have electricity in home. The time I was set to build a windmill, I was uh, 14 years. Uh, it took me uh, um, about uh, two, two months to build the first windmill.
they couldn't believe that I would make something to generate electricity. What uh, makes people to start realizing that uh, this thing is uh, useful when you uh, power a radio? Was it music that was on the radio? Uh, it was uh, a local Malawian reggae music. And most of the people, they didn't know what I'm doing. They thought that maybe I'm, I'm going mad and uh, maybe I'm crazy. And uh, I didn't see then uh, much support on the first time. But after I've built a little in me, when some people started to uh, realize that, oh, maybe...